The Refining of the Remnant One of the reasons for the astonishing abandonment of the Lord during the Great Apostasy will be the unprecedented degree of deception unleashed by the devil and his two earthly minions the Antichrist and his false prophet. This assault will pour forth a veritable ocean of falsehood, which will overwhelm all but the truly elect. If there is a silver lining in this terrible cloud of apostasy, it is to be found in the refining of the faith produced by the pressures of the tribulation of all those who are truly God's people. It is true that the refining of the hearts of His people, the strengthening of faith, and the testing of our commitment to Jesus Christ, are givens in every era. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been see grieved by various trials, seven that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, in contrast to the eternal rewards of faith, proved genuine through testing. 1 Peter 1 6-7. For he knows my path. He has tested me, has assayed the value of my faith like one does gold bullion. I will come forth like gold from the crucible. Job 23:10. The smelter for silver and the crucible for gold, but the Lord is the one who tests hearts. Proverbs 17:3. Behold, I have refined you, but not like silver, it is a furnace of affliction in which I have tested you. Isaiah 48:10. However, one of God's purposes for the tribulation is to draw a very vivid distinction between those who have chosen for him and those who are not willing to do so. Seventy-sevens have been decreed for your people in your holy city to complete the rebellion and consummate sins, bring apostasy to the full, to atone for iniquity and bring in everlasting righteousness, the saving work of Christ, and to seal up vision and prophecy and anoint the holy of holies, the coming of the kingdom. Daniel 9:24. In the tribulation there will be no middle ground. Only those who are sure and solid in their faith in Jesus Christ will be able to avoid being drawn into apostasy and the false religion, and at the same time endure the emotional pounding of the tribulation and all that it will encompass. Because you have kept my command to persevere in me, I will also keep you from the hour of testing which is about to come upon the entire inhabited world, to put the inhabitants of the world to the test. Revelation 3.10 For in addition to all the unprecedented difficulties of that time, our faith will also be pressured from all quarters, from false prophets and false Christs, from false Christians infiltrating our fellowship, from the departure from our fellowship of those we love, from dissension in our ranks, and from the increasing alienation and persecution we will feel and experience from Christian groups who will actively ridicule us for our perverse persistence in our faith. This last point is very important to understand. For the refining of the remnant of true believers during the tribulation will be much more a matter of believers separating themselves, rather than being separated out. Everyone likes a growing church, and during the ecumenical movement of the tribulation's first half the churches who compromise with it will grow as never before. Within there will be excitement, hoopla, entertainment everything but Christ. Without there will be isolation revulsion, contempt, but for the sake of Christ. Those who are not pure will fall away into apostasy during this terrible time, but those who are pure will be purified even further, so that when our Lord does come, he will come to a people ready and prepared, and he will come to rescue and avenge them. And it will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We put our hope in him that he would deliver us and he did. This is our Lord. We put our hope in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his deliverance. Isaiah 25 9 Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way, say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear, your God will come, he will come with vengeance, with divine retribution, he will come to save you. Isaiah 35 3-4 The persecution of the true church and the Lord's retribution at the second advent are the twin foci of the great tribulation, from the divine point of view. Small wonder then that the tribulation will be a winnowing process designed to separate the wheat from the chaff, so that the bride to whom our Lord returns will be holy and pure in every way, John answered them all and said, I am symbolically baptizing you with water. But one who is more powerful than I am is coming, 
one whose sandal thong I am not sufficient to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand ready to cleanse his threshing floor and gather the grain into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Luke 3 16-17 for believers, therefore, the tribulation will not be a time of pointless suffering, but rather a time of purposeful purging, refining, and purifying of all those who have genuinely committed themselves to following Jesus Christ faithfully to the end. And even from among the ranks of those who have insight, some will be persecuted, in order to refine, purify, and cleanse them until the final end. For it is yet to come at its appointed time. Daniel 11:35. And during that time of the end many will purify and cleanse themselves, and will be refined, smelted in a crucible. But the wicked will act wickedly, nor will any of the wicked understand. But those who give these matters careful attention will understand. Daniel 12.10 If past biblical parallels of such periods of refinement can provide any guide whatsoever, we may expect the remnant refined in this way to be small indeed, at least relative to the billions worldwide who currently identify themselves as Christians. Only three escaped from Sodom, only eight escaped the Great Flood, only 600 dared to throw in their lot with David during his trials in the Judean desert, only 7,000 refused to bow the knee to Baal during Jezebel's apostasy. Throughout human history, the number of the elect has always been but a tiny fraction of the total human population. And even within the apparent community of believers there have inevitably been many who were lukewarm, and many who were not believers at all. Just as not all Israel is Israel, so it should not be surprising that not all who claim to be part of Christ's church truly are. However, the significant difference between the present time and the tribulation is that, in the midst of that crucible to come, all those who are not dedicated to Jesus above everything else in their lives, will be winnowed out and poured out like dross into apostasy. Although your people may be like the sand of the sea, O Israel, only a remnant of them will return. For a final reckoning has been decreed, overflowing with righteousness. For the Lord is about to accomplish a reckoning which is both final and firmly decreed in the midst of the entire earth. Isaiah 10 22-23 when the rush to join the new ecumenical movement and the false religion it spawns does come, we who have trusted in Christ for our salvation must remember that the presence of a crowd does not guarantee the presence of God. Even though we may be pariahs and outcasts in the eyes of the world, God is no respecter of persons, nor is he influenced by appearances as the world is, nor is he impressed by mere numbers. What impresses God is the attitude of our hearts. He sees us for what we really are, his own children if we but stay true to this faith faithful to the end. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us to actually be called children of God. And that is just what we are. For this reason the world does not understand us because it has not understood him. Beloved, we are already the children of God, but what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when H.E., our Lord Jesus Christ is revealed to us at the resurrection, we will be exactly like him, and so we'll see him exactly like he is, at the resurrection, we will have new bodies exactly like our Lord's, and know him as we are known by him. 1 John 3 1-2 So strive all that much more than, brothers, to make your calling and election secure through these good works. By devoting yourselves to these things, i.e., virtue, growth and the Christian production which springs from faith, you shall never be tripped up along your way. For it is by such means that your path into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be smoothly and generously paved. 2 Peter 1:10-11. So then, my brothers, just as you have always been obedient to the truth, not just when I was present with you, but even more so now in my absence, go to work on your salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians 2:12. In terms of historical analogies, the situation and experience of the Thessalonian believers presents a very close parallel to what genuine Christians will have to face during the tribulation. They too were attacked by false teachers and found themselves under the most severe testing, a combination of circumstances which led the Apostle Paul to be greatly concerned about their spiritual welfare. But, in spite of everything, they triumphed over all threats to their faith through their joyous reliance on the Word of God 
becoming a model to their contemporaries and to us of how believers should behave in tribulations great and small. Like the wise virgins in our Lord's parable, we too must commit ourselves to stocking up on the oil of truth, while it is yet day, that our lamp of faith may not be extinguished during that dark night to come. Instead of allowing ourselves to become over-focused upon this present world in the relative calm of the moment, we should do all that we can to prepare for the struggle ahead. Remembering that we are but pilgrims on this earth, walking but a Sabbath day's journey every day, one day at a time, on our way to Zion, following the example of those who have gone before. These all died while still walking in faith, though they had not received the fulfillment of their promises. But while they lived they did catch sight of these promises from a distance. And saluted them, so to speak, thus making it plain to all the world that they were in effect strangers and sojourners on the earth. For people who express their faith in this way make it quite evident that they are eagerly in search of a homeland other than the world they now pass through. Indeed, if these believers' hearts had yearned for the land from which they had departed, they would have had ample opportunity to turn back. But they were zealous for a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. He has, in fact, prepared a city for them. Hebrews 11:13-16. As those upon whom the end of the ages is about to come, we who have determined to remain faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ, come what may, must have no illusions about either the difficulty of the task that lies ahead, or the subtlety of the testing through which we must pass on our way to safe deliverance. Bless our God, O peoples, and make the sound of his praises heard. He has preserved our lives, and has not let our feet stumble. Yes, O oh God, you tested us, and you refined us as one refined silver. You brought us into the prison fortress. You set tribulation upon us. You made men right over our heads. We went through fire and water. But in spite of all this you have brought us forth into a place of refreshment. Psalm 66 8-12. When the whirlwind passes by, the wicked are no more, but the righteous will stand firm forever. Proverbs 10:25. When calamity comes, the wicked are brought down, but even in death the righteous have a refuge. Proverbs 14.32 Let us not put Christ to the test, as some of them. The Exodus generation did and were killed by serpents. And let us not complain, as some of them complained and were killed by the destroyer. These things happened to them as an example to us and were written to warn us. To avoid similar apostasy, we who live at the culmination of the ages, at the doorstep of the tribulation. So let him who thinks he stands firm beware lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10 9-12 Finally, although the parable of the wheat and the tares has its true fulfillment at the end of our Lord's millennial reign, the principle of leaving the tares to grow in company with the wheat certainly has a direct application here. The tares or weeds among the good grain represent unbelievers, mixed into the church visible by Satan, in such a cunning way that only God is capable of discerning the good from the bad. This is certainly reflective of the situation we see today in our own church era of Laodicea. To this moment, God has, for the most part, left the tares to grow beside the wheat so as not to judge the whole church in a general uprooting. Under the pressures of the tribulation, however, it will rapidly become apparent who are of the wheat and who are of the tares, as our Lord begins to make the distinction between the wicked and the righteous progressively clear, one of the tribulation's salient characteristics as we have repeatedly seen. Viewed from this broader perspective, which takes in both believers and unbelievers in the church visible in one panoramic view, the process of refining, winnowing separation, and selective harvesting of the elect initiated by the great apostasy, will also reveal by this very separation, the identity of the reprobate tares, now largely hidden from our earthly eyes. Compare also the parable of the net which gathers good and bad, and the parable of the wedding banquet where some who show up are not worthy. Now the field is the world. And the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the evil one. Matthew 13 38. The Parable of the Wedding Feast. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son, and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, 
he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew 22 1-14 the, the Parable of the Dragnet Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore, and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 13 47-50 Please like, comment, share and subscribe for more content. May God bless you and yours with peace, love.